Okay, so uh, I want to um, thank you for the the real privilege to um, speak uh, today. Um, m much of what I'll be talking about is, is really sort of the distillation of um, what I've learned um, as chair of the Department of Biomedical Data Science, and then um, dur during my time, uh, both as a, a, an investor and, a, and operator, and upon my return to Stanford, um, the thinkings around how we should be moving um, the, the field forward. And, and in particular, I, I really want to center us on what has been the core of what I've tried to accomplish over the the 10 years I've been at Stanford, which, which is namely to, to really move the needle in precision health in, in understudied populations. Um, I was recruited by Mike um, Snyder when, when he was uh, recently named, or he, early when he was named chair, chair of genetics. And, and, and really um, the, the sell for me was we're, we're going to have this opportunity to, to really move the needle. And, and what you're passionate about is what I'm passionate about. And, and so we began re really almost with a call to arms saying that uh, it's it's a massive, massive, massive problem that the vast majority of studies have been done in populations of, of European descent um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and, and when we first called attention to this issue, the, the numbers were something like 95% of participants in genetic studies were of European descent. Today, um, they've gotten slightly better. It's only about 80% are of European descent. Uh, the other 19% um, are, are largely Asian and, and largely Chinese due to the, the wonderful and very logical investment in, in genomics that China's made over the last 15 to 20 years, um, that for fruit. And then there's not much that, that honestly has happened in, in minority populations. We, we led the largest study to date, which was 50,000 people in the PAGE study and, and emptied the freezers. I, I actually won't have time to tell you about it because it's you know I've only got twenty minutes, but but uh, we did it and and it was a wonderful study. And what we found out is that we now need to really go work directly with the healthcare system in order for this to, to work. And and part of the reason is just that the, the data is all in 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 the ether at this point, and the data you're going to want to collect is going to be distilled from the ether going forward. And so if you think about the changing landscape of the country, the only way you get ahead of this is, is by not relying on just the NIH to move the needle. It's literally by interjecting yourself into the operations of the healthcare system to catch data. And, and this is the one slide that I've um, gone back to over my time um, initially is trying to start the department and, and then as, as, as sort of the a senior member of the faculty. Um, and, and the logic here is that when you want to optimize in biomedical data science, you really need to understand what objective function you're optimizing for. And, and that's going to depend on what bucket you sit here. So, so when um, the dean says we want to do precision health, I, I really believe, and, and, uh, and SHC says we want to do precision health, we, we're taking this point of view. We have to be taking that point of view. We are a care provider organization. So, so we are very interested in the data that's in our electronic health record, omics, imaging, pathology, outcomes, prescription. And in some sense, that's obvious, right? We, we're in the business of delivering healthcare. If we're not integrating our data, what are we doing? Data silos are a bad idea. And, and asking about whether we should be bringing artificial intelligence and, and smart tools to mining our own data is a little bit like being in retail in the 90s and asking whether you should set up a website. Yeah, you basically need to set up a website or you're going to get run over. But just because you set up a website for retail doesn't mean you're Amazon overnight, right? And just because we can munch on data and do AI doesn't mean that, that we're really moving the needle in a learning healthcare system. The world of drug and insurance moves moves the needle. They, they, they're the deep pocket. And of course, most of healthcare economics is simply a conversation between us as care providers and, and the money folks. Um, Ultimately, though, the data you want, at least in the US healthcare system, is not in here. And the reason is that this is all billing data. Um, I can get extraordinarily accurate information on everything over 50 bucks, as Nigam would tell you, and I can use that extraordinarily well to classify patients, but I won't have any idea necessarily what the values are or how to extract that. And I would say the, this has already left the building. We, we need to be in the business of explaining to patients why they should trust us with their non medical data that is the health data that will be most necessary to really follow them for health reasons and will certainly be relevant for real world evidence if you're thinking about post-market surveillance. So that's the world we all are going to live in. It's, there's just no doubt about it. And this was telegraphed early with the 23andMe GSK play um, that made it pretty patently clear that that pharma, I mean, GSK has always been the head in, in 
in my opinion, in the, in the genetics analysis space of, of pharma. I had worked with them a decade before in, in doing a large scale analysis of, of human genetic variation. They had already paid for it. So they knew what they were getting themselves into. And it's not a coincidence that this has just now been spacked by Richard Branson to the tune of about three and a half billion dollars. Because that's a lot of value that's been created there. I think that's actually a pretty reasonable estimate for for the value locked in that database. For example, you know, we, we know the story of PCSK9 inhibitors and how they basically are the best example we have of bench to bedside and, and using normal human genetic variation. So looking at literally normally distributed human genetic variation, looking at the extremes of the distribution and picking people at the ends of the bell curve. Well, what happens is that you can go out and get at things like familial hypercholesterolemia and the genetics of familial hypercholesterolemia, which has been extraordinary, right? 90% of patients are undiagnosed with, with FH, and, and we know this is a, a massive ticking time bomb. There's some people, if you're a homozygous FH carrier, you know, 20x higher risk of, you know, adverse cardiovascular events, one in 200 people have it. I mean, it is and has been the poster child for precision health and, and Stanford's been very involved in this. And, and I would argue that, you know, in, in my opinion, this is you know laid out by Helen Hobbs and colleagues 15 years ago. Go out, study the genetics, do it in a multi-ethnic setting, look for protective loss of function mutations. In this case, it was knockouts of PCSK9 that convinced us that we know these were going to be protective loss of function mutations, but more importantly, that the um, reduction that we see with protective loss of function mutations um, is, is not only correlative, but it, it is actually causal in the reduction of coronary heart disease. And so this idea that the genes that predict your bad cholesterol predict your adverse cardiovascular, and that's how you should place the drug bets, has been borne out. All of the drugs that went to market trying to lower LDL, you know, did well and have, have, have met good clinical endpoints. The ones that raise HDL have certainly raised the biomarker, but there's been no moving of the needle on, on the clinical endpoints, and that's why they failed in clinical trials. But just getting through the trials is not enough, right? We've got an engine. To, we can go out and look for lots and lots of, of, of lots of function mutations. We're now looking at lots and lots of different ways to drug PCSK9, including vaccination and, and gene therapy. Um, I, I would argue that because of the way the um, initial entrants priced it, they, they priced themselves out. You know, 95% of PCSK9 um, prescriptions are denied the first time. 60% are denied eventually. You know, people are not getting... What, what, what they should be getting. And, and a large part of that's the case hasn't been made. And so you have to go make the case and, and that's now happening. Um, and real world evidence is playing a, a big role. So, um, and, and, and a huge chunk of this is that you're not gonna put a third of Americans on a drug that costs 12 grand a year. You know, that has to come out of prevention. Prevention is the, the you know, the bottom half of, of claimants in an insurance, you just don't have the money for it, right? You, you've allocated about a thousand dollars per, kind of healthy person in your pool, you, you don't have that for people with kind of slightly high cholesterol. You, you just, it doesn't exist, right? All the money goes to high-end acute care towards the end of life. And so if you want to put in prevention, you even if FH and you know, you're know you preventing heart attacks in the future, the case is very, very hard to make. Um, but it, it, it has to be made because the current status is just abysmal, right? You know, the average age at which people are diagnosed is in their you know, late 40s, early 50s, they've already been on lipid lowering drugs for a decade, already had an adverse event. I mean, this is just not the way we should be doing things. We should be screening early on in life. And um, Nigam and, and um, Josh have done some incredible work in this optimization problem. As many of you know, the Finding FH initiative, which was led out of Stanford and led by them, you know, created an algo based on our data that they trained and used to go find additional individuals in, in, um, in, in the Stanford healthcare system who, who are at risk of, uh, of FH, but more importantly, to then generalize this model. And again, it's not my work, it's really Nigam and Josh's work, but the logic here is that, you know, you can use these data, interact in the real world, go out and make a synthetic map of all the FH patients and, and unlock this for physicians using technology. So if you're a doc, you can go to the FH Foundation website and, and log in and see whether, you know, the algo has predicted whether you patients in your practice uh, are likely to be suffering from FH. And, and in some sense, that's magical. And, and in some sense, it's inevitable, right? How do we not have some of the top people in the country in data analytics, munch on data and, and use it to find people at risk? I mean, I mean, if we couldn't do that, it would be just a huge mistake of a, of a healthcare system. But so we can do it. It's just a question of why would you want to do it? You have to incentivize it. It's not done routinely because it's not part of the acute care um, system. Um, but there's lots of people gunning for you. So, so three years ago, I was predicting this uh, uh, when Color launched their FH test. And, and the logic here is just 
plain old Clay Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma. So if you're familiar with that, the idea is that you've got a bottom end of the market that's really met by kind of the consumer end, and it's not really all that good, but it gets better faster and sometimes cheaper than the existing technology. So before you know it, it overtakes. And again, one one nice example is, you know, many when cell phones um, replacing landlines in a very Schumperian way and takes, you know, it's, it's funny, if you look at the, the data, it's like, it actually was like 5% in, in 2004 of people that had only a cell phone. Um, that crossed to 50% in, in less than 13 years. Okay, so move fast. Here's the argument I'd like to make. Why on earth do you have to go get your genetic testing at Stanford? It makes no sense, right? Helix, Color, all of these should be able to gun for our business and should be gunning to put us out of business, out of the tertiary and coordinate care business by preventing disease in the first place. And that's the world I want to live in. I'd certainly love to incentivize that by broad data sharing and, and making it all work. So, and, and how's it going to work? Well, it's obvious it's how it's going to work. It's because tech has no choice but to jump in with all feet into this pool. Right, it is by far the largest industry in the country now. Healthcare over overtook retail and manufacturing. They are the largest companies in the world by market cap. It is not an analogy that they are the old oil companies. It is simply a statement about their market cap and power and cash on hand. So, of course, Apple has more cash on hand than anybody. Microsoft, Al uh, Alphabet, they they have to reinvest that money. So, what are they going to do? You're going to put it into buying your own stock or going into healthcare. And, and this is why I think the ship has already left. I mean, it's, it's now obvious that if you're doing studies, you're going to do them on an Apple Watch or some other wearable, follow people longitudinally using these tools. You're not going to want to do this the old way, especially post-COVID. That's just accelerated this faster. Um, and, and, and that world is already here. Right. In some sense, the, the, the APIs that allow our data in and out means that we're not the, the, the the holders of the data. We're, we're just the producers of some parts of the funny data that has to do with billing and, and rather biased data. So if you really want good data, you, you got to go rebuild those pipes from the ground up, I would argue. And, and this will happen. This is happening already. There are things like Inside Tracker that's just looking at, you know, all kinds of metabolites that, that you can measure. And, you know, Mike's got QBio. There are a bunch of these. And, and, and the logic is not you know, one company or another, but rather that all of this is telling you about the direction of cash flowing and, and what disruption is looking like. Um, I'll, I'll end by saying this eventually all has to be in some kind of an auditable system that people will want to believe contains information that's actionable. And this is just one example of, of such a system. This is a, a health coin that could be, um, you know, sort of um, accruing uh, value as you've got evidence that a person is sticking to a particular plan, but could be lots of ways that you accrue value in a, in a token that brings together two pieces of data. Maybe you're just snapping Gino and Fino together that enough creates value that, that could be percolated. Um, and, and that'll have to happen in one way or another. I don't think you're going to sort of encrypt everything and keep it on, on the blockchain, but you will need to keep permission files that are external to the data owners that tells you who's got access to what and, and who can you believe. And that has to be the world of smart contracts where we're going to move. You're not going to do this by having a bunch of lawyers at Stanford work with a bunch of lawyers at Google. That's not the way you solve this in 20 years. Okay. So with that, I'm going to end and say, you know, healthcare delivery costs are the biggest challenge to human health and well-being. Innovation doesn't help lower cost. Innovation in the short term will increase cost. You got to pay for innovation. Um, but long term, you can maybe bend the curve if, if you punch in the right direction. And this is all a data uh, supply chain problem and a question of what functions you want to optimize. The, the algos are there. You can optimize lots of functions. And, and right now, we've, we've been optimizing for billing in a lot of systems, if, if you know what you've been optimizing for in the first place, and not in any way, shape, or form for actual health delivery, as we know. And so you've got to come up with new functions and new ways of, of, of achieving those economics. And it will only happen by incentivizing patients to share their data because it's, number one, the right thing to do. And number two, for many people, the most valuable asset they own. So in the future, this will be part of how they will accrue um, their wealth or universal basic income or whichever way you look at it. I don't like in, in the European systems where you agree to have your data um, used by the open healthcare system as, as part of a social compact. I think we, we just like contracts more in this country, so we'll go with some, some kind of contractual obligation. That would be my logic. Okay, I'll stop there and answer any questions if there's time. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Carlos. What a, what a great overview and a, what an amazing amount of information. So, you know, a lot of moving parts to be considered, and you know, did a great job in kind of articulating those. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the things like you mentioned, especially towards the end in terms of kind of protecting the data, there's the, there was privacy and then there's the security aspect of that. You know, how, how do we get people more comfortable so we can kind of do the types of things you're saying? Like what you mentioned some things like incentivizing them, um, other Yeah, there are a zillion experiments being run, right? So, so let's look at um, a million experiments being run. So, you know, kind of like Stanford, right? Let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, my, my belief is we're going to absolutely move to subscription health systems. There's just no doubt, you know, your Apple care will be Apple health care and it'll, you know, um, probably come with Apple retail clinics. That's what I would do if I were Tim Cook. All right, retail's cheap. There's a bunch of space. Why, why wouldn't I do that? And um, I probably follow suit if I were Sundar. You know, there's there's plenty of space at the mall, and the, and healthcare is already pretty fragmented. So you are like you have an Apple brand. You could have a, a sort of Google. You give up more data in exchange for, you know, lower lower costs and not as many options, perhaps. I don't know. But but I think it, there's just no way of getting around the fact that this will be an information business. Mm -hmm. Healthcare will absolutely be an information business. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I'm wondering, you know, kind of a general question, you know, what, what are companies, you know, doing right? What do you think they could be improved on kind of in general, or if you have particular examples you'd like to touch on? Sorry, I think one AirPod is working. So I don't know if you got the whole thing there, but, and oh. I didn't hear your question, Ryan, because that's why I, I put it back in. Can you repeat? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I interrupted. I didn't mean to interrupt you if I did. Um, no, no, I know. I think I stopped talking and then realized. I didn't know if you could hurt me, so <laughs> you could repeat. <laughs> we we got we got some of that, I think. But you no, know, I, I think we we got the gist. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering, you know, as a general question, you know, what are companies doing? You know, currently, what are what are companies doing right in this space? Um, and, you know, what where's their areas you think are for improvement? Just kind of, you know, on a, on a general. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I think the one entrant that I didn't mention is pharma. I actually think pharma post COVID um, has, has done a wonderful job of, of rebranding. Re it's not so great image uh, uh, across American consumers oh, two, three years ago. So it would not surprise me if pharma actually ends up now trying to make a straight up case to, to individuals. And that'll be very interesting um, because I think tech, so Facebook, for example, had hundreds of people working on healthcare un until the 2016 um, elections threw into question, you know, a lot of, a lot of questions. And, and, and that I think forced them to shut it down, you know, or else you would have heard a lot more about healthcare from, from Facebook is, is my sense, you know? Um, and, and I think, you know, big tech is, is under a lot of scrutiny right now. And so, you know, what Alphabet's done is now compartmentalize this into Verily and that's worked really, really well. I think um, Apple, has you know stuck to consumer devices and selling consumer devices and that's that's worked well and then amazon has done wonderful things in logistics and then uh, you know tr tried to do abc but it didn't work i mean like they, they unfolded it right they, they couldn't figure it out some of the smartest entrepreneurs in the country in the history of the country came together and said yeah too hard <laughs> you know so, so i think that means insurance is under massive massive pressure I think you may get some really interesting solutions being floated. Everything from, the, you know, single payer to eliminate employer mandate for insurance and let everybody buy stuff on the open market, and then you'll really get price transparency. Uh, I'd probably opt for that, honestly. I think that's that's a huge, you know, the lack of price transparency, which works in our favor, to be honest, at Stanford, uh, is is one of the hugest issues in 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 this space that I think gets absolutely crunched. And, and crushed in the 2020s. Cause you're just, you know, like there's just gonna be no reason why you're gonna be allowed to do a 10X more expensive surgery at Stanford than, than somewhere else. It's the exact same surgery. 